please, a round of applause for Brad Cry from the Institute for the Future. Thank you, Will, and thank you all for having me here. Um, like Will mentioned, our role at Institute for the Future is to think about 10 years out, so forecasting 10 years, what's possible, what could happen, what the future could look like, and then to sort of ground that in the world of today. In light of what's possible, what can we do, how can we decide, what are the decisions and things we should be doing. So what I'm going to be doing is sharing a little bit of just what's possible. That's kind of my goal, is to kind of provoke you, to get you immersed in a, a world of future possibilities. So I think that this marks the longest I've ever been in a data conference without hearing the phrase big data, uh, because we've been talking for 20 minutes now, and nobody said big data. <laughs> it's impressive. Um, big data, the term actually, for those who don't know, the term originates from the idea that you have so much information, so much data to manage, that it's a problem for you. It's not a resource, actually. We, we think of it as a problem. And you can see that in this kind of a graph reflected here. Uh, we're down in 2013 now. And if you look on this chart, we're in the world where we don't really have any information relative to what we'll have in 10 years. Uh, this is from, from the research firm IDG. Um, so in other words, you know, we just need information right now. We're, nobody has too many emails. Nobody's trying to manage their phone and their laptop and their iPad. We're just, we're just in the desert. That's what this would indicate. Um, so the, there's a, a sense that I think a lot of people have of how are we going to manage all of this stuff. And the way we talk about it at the Institute is not as a world of big data, but as a world of abundant data. A world where we can think of all of these different sources of information as just this incredible source of value. This new tool that we can use to advance health in our lives, in our health practices, in our communities. Wherever we are, we can really tap into this to advance our health work. So, uh, just conceptually what this looks like uh, is this sort of diagram here. You can think of it as both the information we have uh, in the World Wide Web, stuff from our credit cards, all of the data exhaust we produce in our daily lives. You think of the sources of information from the government. And then you could also think about sources in sort of the deep web, in our medical libraries, in our hospital systems, in our medical records, in our devices, and the stuff we carry around us. And the argument here th that we're making is that we need to be thinking about how to connect all of these different sources of data. That we need to be able to think about how do I connect my credit card information, which tells you what I've been buying and what food I've been eating, with, let's say, my hospital record. Because that's where we're going to generate really new, really novel insights. So now I'm going to move to a set of just provocative questions designed to kind of encourage you to think a little bit creati more creatively about the future. And the first is, what if you could make the invisible visible? And we put together, this is something we call an artifact from the future. Uh, it's imagine uh, an archaeologist jumping forward in time and bringing back a little snapshot of what a future could look like. We put this together a couple years ago, and it might be familiar to those of you who live in the mission who see Googlers rolling around with a Google Glass. Um, it's a world in which we have a data overlay over our eyes with us at all times. And this is somebody, you know, this is sort of the invisible made visible in our daily lives. You can see there's somebody who's trying to quit, quit smoking and wants some social support. You can see that you're trying to figure out which of your identities to broadcast because you're on a business trip and you have some business colleagues nearby. Um, but you could also imagine that this same view would look very, very differently to a teenager instead of a business traveler. So instead of trying to figure out how you're navigating your business relationships, you might be trying to figure out if you want a little robot reality skin to walk around with so everybody else who has Google Glass sees you as a robot. Uh, you might be putting a rainbow-colored wig on somebody just for your own amusement. And what all of this has to do with health is that there's all this hidden data in our lives that we need to be tracking. There's all this invisible stuff that we can understand. Asthma is just one example, and it's a, probably the best and the most well-known example of the way the environment impacts our health outcomes. If you go to one block in San Francisco, you can imagine great community. I live in Hayton Cole. You can see the pollution there, and it's very different from the pollution in the inner sunset. And it's very different from the pollution in Bay Point. And if you can start to track those little bits of information, you can do new things. That's what Asmapolis is about. And I know they're going to be speaking a little bit later. For those of you who haven't heard, it's just a GPS sensor built into an asthma inhaler. And it's one way of starting to capture that invisible information. So what this could look like in the long run is something like this. This is sort of a wearable computing artifact. And you can see all sorts of little details that you can now start to aggregate and put together about health just around you. You can find a quantified self meetup. You can learn about the air quality all over the world. 
And then you can also find things like a heart signal or a heart circle forming nearby. Maybe you want to meditate. Maybe you've had a stressful day. You can connect the resources you need just when you need them. What it points to, I think, again, is that broader dynamic of being able to start to connect all sorts of different information and put it together in a way that people can manage. Now, one other sort of invisible kind of information to highlight here is a very different kind of invisible information. A group out in Israel put together this thing called Baby Beat, and I'm really kind of blown away by what it does. It's very simple. It's totally brilliant, though. They put a camera on a baby, and they look for very, very subtle changes in their breathing and temperature and so on, stuff that no person through their naked eye could see. And when they see those subtle changes, what they find is it indicates that there's a likelihood that this, the infant is going to experience sudden infant death, it's going to experience SIDS. And so it'll sound an alarm, which wakes the kid up, and that significantly decreases the likelihood that the kid will die. And what's interesting to me about this and what the contrast between asthma is, is that it points to the various scales of invisibility here. We can think about the invisibility in our communities. We can think about the invisibility in our environments and our social networks. But we can also think about this very high resolution data we're going to be able to pull out, manage, and use to intervene in the next decade. The next question here has to do with using data analytics to distribute a kind of health micro work. And for those of you who don't know the term micro work, it's, it's, it comes from Mechanical Turk, Amazon's Mechanical Turk. And the idea is that they're little tasks, everyday tasks, like transcribing a business card, taking a picture of a menu at a restaurant, that if your job was to take pictures of menus at restaurants for eight hours a day, day after day after day, you would go absolutely crazy. You would probably, you know, you, you, you could not do it. But for five minutes, while you're out at dinner, you could take a picture of the menu, send it over to Amazon, get $3 or $5 or whatever the task is, and move on and have dinner. So that's micro work. It's just little individual tasks distributed, aggregated, put together. Um, interestingly, just as an aside, what they found is the people who do micro work the most are receptionists and security guards, people who get paid to wait around to have something to do. And in the moments they don't have anything to do, they just monetize those moments of boredom. Anyway, what all that has to do with is new ways of distributing health analytics. So this is a cell. It's a malarial cell, disease cell. And it's you know, a piece of analytics. What's interesting about it is that one of the big challenges in diagnosing malaria is simply having trained staff in places that you have malaria. Because not surprisingly, you don't have lots of trained experts in places that you have lots of malaria. So what some researchers at UCLA did is they developed a really interesting game interface where you can train people for about 30 minutes, so just 30 minutes to an hour, any, day, any person, you don't need medical background, you just need an iPhone go through a training, and then you shoot cells that look diseased with a syringe. And then you don't shoot the cells that look fine. And what they found is that by aggregating all of those opinions through a system that conceptually looks like this, you can diagnose malaria within 99% agreement of a trained expert. Think about that. Random folks playing a game after 30 minutes of training aggregate a few of their opinions as good as a doctor kind of mind-blowing to me. Another example of this is one some of you have probably heard of a Foldit. Um, there was a long-standing AIDS protein folding problem. Rather than try, after years and years of grinding their wheels at it, instead of you know, grinding their wheels some more, they d created a game, Tetris-like interface, and within two weeks, this AIDS folding protein problem was solved. Uh, they published the results in Nature with 50,000 co-authors, which took a long time to get in the journal, I think. So again, that's sort of thinking differently about data analytics. And what I think the application to health, particularly community health, is is something like this. This is the Pulse Point app that's developed by the San Ramon Fire Department. A lot of you may have heard of this, and it's a really kind of phenomenal achievement in thinking about how do you distribute emergency health work in a much more effective way. It's very simple. And actually, there's a great story that goes with this. The fire chief of the San Ramon Police, uh, Fire Department Odd background, he was a fire chief who had previously worked as a technology executive. So that was kind of a strange background to have. And he was sitting, having lunch one day, waiting, you know, just hanging out with some colleagues. And he heard this siren getting closer and closer and closer. 
And what he realized as he got out of having lunch with his colleagues, sitting there with his fire truck, sitting there with all his equipment, was that somebody had gone into cardiac arrest literally next door. And if he had known about it, he could have done something about it. But he didn't know about it. So what he did was he created this very simple app that anybody can sign up for, anybody who's a first responder, trained CPR, and they can indicate, I want to be notified if there's an event nearby. That's it. And so if there's an event nearby, of course, they send the traditional paramedics, but they also send an army of trained first responders. Immediately after releasing this app, actually, first responder classes were so popular, they were like booked out for two or three months in advance in San Ramon, because people all of a sudden felt they could put the skill of learning first response to use. Um, the other great thing about this is they've made it completely open source. They want everybody to use it. And it's just a great example of thinking about how can you take sort of innovation and, and spread it in an open way. So my final what if question here is what if you could use open data to design persuasive health interfaces? So Matthew spoke about this and, and I showed a, a similar kind of diagram of how do you get information to the pers right person, right place, right time by activity? That's the question, is in this world where there's so much information out there, how do we get people the information they need exactly when they need it? So we think one example. Huh. You know, I have a standard joke while I'm trying to get this uh, clicker to work, which is that we're so in the future at Institute for the Future that we're good at future technologies, but not present day clicker technologies. <laughs> um, and I'm one too far now. There we go. OK, excellent. So this is an artifact from the future, and it's something we created a couple years ago. And this is someone kind of at the gym. You just imagine sort of an experience in an exercise facility five, ten years down the road. And she could see herself in the mirror, and, and what she can see is that if she exercises for 60 minutes, um, 60 minutes a time, three days a week, that all of a sudden she'll have a much better tomorrow. She'll be a little bit thinner. Her skin tone will be improved. She'll feel better. And what this is really fundamentally is a feedback loop. It's a way to close a gap between the, ex the experience of exercise, which you don't really notice any immediate results in terms of you know, visible, and the experience and the reality of what will happen several years or several months if you continue to exercise. And so this is just one, uh, this is an artifact of what data visualization could look like going forward. And it's based on something called the Proteus effect, which has actually found that if you get to see yourself in the future, you can actually make better decisions in the present. And picking up on that theme, and this is actually a thing that really exists. It's being done by Merrill Lynch and Bank of America. And the idea is very similar to the challenges we have in health. It's how do we get people to save for their retirement? Much like how do we get people to exercise today, even though a glass of wine and dessert would be much more fun right now. And so what they've done is you upload a photo of yourself, and then you get to see yourself a little bit older. And the hope is that if you see your older self, you'll say, oh, my older self would really like me to have a 401k that has money in it right now. <laughs> and so maybe I should help my older self out and save a little bit more. It's just a way of making data more persuasive. It's a way of engaging us a little bit better. So one kind of final provocation to leave you with for thinking about information, thinking about how to design information in a persuasive way. Uh, this is a scene that probably lots of us are familiar with, particularly those of us who travel a lot. You're on the road. You've had a long day. You feel great after a successful meeting. You're about to get on a flight, and you want something to eat. And you know you, know you should probably go get a salad next door, but the Mars bar looks really tasty. And you like Skittles a lot. And you're, just trying, you're, you're kind of battling your demons, right? So what if instead of visualizing your future self, you visualize something like this? You blocked out the information you don't want. Instead of knowing how many calories are in that Skittles bar or the Skittles bag, what you learn is that you need to run for 67 minutes in order to justify that bag of Skittles. And then you see that your friend Neela removed things that she knows are really, really tempting to you and that you shouldn't consume. And the point of this, and the, where I want to leave you with this, is that when we think about sort of persuasive data, persuasive design, persuasive interfaces, when we think about that exponential curve in data, one of the challenges is going to be to be really creative about the information we provide to people. Because something like calories, for a lot of people, isn't going to do much good. But knowing that you have to run for an hour will persuade people. 
So as you sort of approach some of these questions, I think the challenge is not just to think about technical feasibility, but really also to think about the design and persuasive aspects. So with that, um, I'll thank you all. This is where you can find me. Um, I'll be around for the rest of the day, so thank you so much.